when F1 pay drivers were actually amazing. F1 pay drivers get quite a lot of criticism for being in the sport just purely because someone paid for them to be there. I mean, Formula 1 isn't cheap and has always been a sport where you need financial backing of some sort to get to the top. Modern day pay drivers are nowhere near as bad as what we saw 30 years ago. In fact, this video is all about drivers who paid their way to at least get a debut in Formula 1 and turned out to be pretty damn good. To some degree, every driver is a pay driver, bringing their own sponsors to the team. But not all pay drivers are the same. Some drivers take their personal sponsors from team to team, allowing them to pick and choose where they race. Some have their seats paid for by another team as part of their development on loan, or some just plain buy their way into Formula 1 with a big chunk of cash. Let's take a look at some standout names which you could put under the term pay driver. Ayrton Senna much of Ayrton Senna's early career was possible due to his privileged childhood as the son of the wealthy Sao Paulo landowner and factory owner Milton De Silva, helping him to afford his way through carts and junior series back home. However, after moving to the UK in 1981 to continue his career, he was under pressure from his parents to return to Brazil to take up the family business. Before he left, he was offered a Formula Ford 2000 drive for the cost of £10,000, which may not seem like a lot now, but back in the 1980s, that's serious Wonga. Ayrton took up the offer and returned to the UK with big sponsors from Benerge, the Bank of Rio de Janeiro state, and Paul, a jeans factory covering his costs. From there, he went on to win the British and European Ford 2000 championships in 1982. Even when he made his way up to F1 with Tolman in 1984 and later with Lotus, McLaren and Williams, the major driver-linked sponsors stayed. The most iconic of these was the Brazilian bank Banco Nacional, which supported him from 1985 to 1994 and was unusual as the only McLaren driver to display non-team branding on his overalls during this era. Nicky Lauda Arguably the most famous and unique pay driver in F1 history, three-time F1 champion Nicky Lauda decided to take the phrase putting your life at stake a bit too literally. After his career stalled in sports cars, Lauda wanted to make the step up to Formula 2 in 1971 and fortunately for him, March's F2 car was available to the highest bidder or to someone with enough funds to keep the struggling team afloat. In an incredibly crafty and genius move, Lauda managed to sign with them before he'd actually got the money together, where the cost of the drive was just over £20,000. He eventually managed to pull enough support together from different sources, including a bank loan from Erste Oysterreich, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to call them bank number one, and topped it off with an advertising deal with Oysterreich Sparkasse, which again, I just cannot say properly, and I'm sorry, but they were a leading Austrian bank. Quickly promoted to a combined F1 and F2 campaign for March in 1972, Bank No. 1 were happy with the extra exposure it brought them and agreed to back him for another season. Yet no sooner had the deal been signed to the tune of £100,000, it was broken off after his grandfather, who was no fan of his racing ambition, got the bank to withdraw their support to bring the lad back to his senses. I can only imagine the fireworks that went off in that family. Forced to find some way to pay for the deal, Lauda contacted another bank, the Reifersen Kassa Bank, bank number two I'm going to call them. Ever persuasive, he eventually got them to agree to give him a loan in exchange for having their branding on the car and crash helmet. Problem was, because the risk of death and then not being able to repay the loan was so high in racing, the only way he could finalise the deal was by securing the money against his life insurance. Unfortunately for him, that F1 season the car was catastrophically bad and he struggled at the back of the grid. With his debts continuing to mount up, Lauda knew he had to risk it all if he wanted to make it into Formula 1. By some miracle, he was able to pay £80,000 for a seat with BRM for 1973. The way he did this is pure genius. He gave the team the impression that the bank would continue to finance his seat despite that not actually being true. He then scheduled the sponsorship payments and loan repayments in three instalments. He'd cover the costs of the first instalments with his starting salary and he hoped by the time the second instalments would be due, he'd already be a star in the making, allowing him to renegotiate the loan. Talk about risking it for the chocolate biscuit. In a stroke of luck, this turned out to be true. His reputation was on the rise, especially after running third at the Monaco Grand Prix before his gearbox failed. 
Eventually, he'd been so impressive that when his BRM teammate Clay Regazzoni rejoined Ferrari for 1974, he spoke so highly of Lauda that they signed him as well. And most importantly, they paid him enough to finally clear his debts. From there, he went on to achieve 25 wins, three world championships and became the first and so far only world champion to come out of retirement and win the title. Not bad for a pay driver, eh? Hold on a second, I see you. Sat there, not subscribed to this beautiful WTF1 YouTube channel. Well, please do click that red button because we have an amazing F1 season coming up with brand new regulations and we are going to be putting out so much content. So please do subscribe. Love ya. Michael Schumacher. It's mad to think that my goat, the greatest of all time, Michael Schumacher, actually started his F1 career as a pay driver. After working his way up through karting, he came to the attention of car manufacturer Mercedes-Benz, who financed the young lad through German Formula Ford and Formula 3. Jochen Niersbach, Mercedes competitions director, then decided to create their very own junior team, consisting of the top three in the 1989 German F3 Championship, Heinz Harald Frentzen, Karl Wendlinger and, unsurprisingly, Michael Schumacher himself. Instead of taking the traditional route through Formula 3000 up to Formula 1, Schumacher and the others joined their world sports car team in 1990, with Michael continuing to impress. This proved to be handy when only a year later, Jordan F1 driver Bertrand Gachot was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment for aggravated assault. This left his team boss Eddie Jordan without a driver 10 days before the 1991 Belgian Grand Prix. The search was on with the boss wanting to bring in the 1982 world champion Keke Rosberg, despite the fact he'd retired five years earlier. Their attention eventually turned to the little-known 22-year-old Michael, especially as Michael's manager Willy Webber told Jordan a bit of a porky pie that he'd driven at Spa around a hundred times before, which was a complete lie. Michael had never driven there. Following a test at Silverstone that cost Michael and Mercedes £80,000, Eddie Jordan wanted Michael to pay for the privilege of racing for them to the tune of £150,000. Niersbach wasn't keen on the idea, having already been in talks with Benetton about a potential seat for 1992, something which would come to light a few months later. However, not wanting to miss out on the opportunity and planning to rejoin F1 in the near future, Mercedes-Benz guaranteed the £150,000 for the seat, with advertising disguised through their sponsors Decra and Tic Tac to avoid a clash with Jordan's Ford-powered engines. Eddie Jordan even admitted that the reason they took Schumacher over other options was the money Mercedes-Benz were willing to pay. Although his F1 debut didn't quite go to plan, retiring on the first lap with clutch problems, he had showed his potential already. He had outqualified his experienced teammate De Cesaris by seven tenths of a second. The following 307 starts and seven world titles shows that not all paid drivers are bad. Fernando Alonso Despite a strong junior career, Fernando Alonso would never have gotten his F1 career off the ground without the financial assistance of one Flavio Briatore. Spotting his potential as a future talent, the Renault boss helped provide the necessary funding to secure him a role as Minardi's test and reserve driver in 2000, before moving him up to a race seat with them the next year, even though the team were uncompetitive. The funny thing is, Fernando Alonso's teammate for that year, Tarso Marx, was actually paid a five-figure sum to be Fernando's teammate that year, so really, he was the real pay driver at the team. Eventually, Alonso was promoted to a Renault race seat in 2003 and went on to become a two-time champion for the team, becoming the youngest F1 world champion at the time. Now, rather than paying for a seat, it's the Spaniards' talents that did the talking. The money followed him rather than the other way around. For example, when Alonso joined Ferrari in 2010, Spanish bank Santander hopped on board as well. It just proves that most drivers need a helping hand to get their big break. We now move on to honourable mentions. These four may not have an F1 title to their name, but they're still pretty good drivers. Sergio Perez It's strange to think of Sergio Perez as anything but deserving of his seat, but when Checo made his F1 debut with Sauber all the way back in 2011, the Mexican was immediately labelled as a pay driver. This was no surprise, since around the age of 14, he's had the backing of Mexican billionaire and telecoms giant Carlos Slim, with Telmex sponsoring the team to the tune of $26 million per year. As of 2022, Mr. Slim is reported to be the 15th richest person in the world, with a worth of around $73 billion. The deal wasn't purely Telmex money, though, more a group of Mexican companies that pulled together, but it was all under the Telmex umbrella. 
Perez's move to McLaren in 2013 wasn't particularly well received as the pay driver label stuck when he was dropped for Kevin Magnussen at the end of the season. It was hailed as a victory for talent over cash. Yet his time at Force India and Racing Point proved that despite the money he brought, Checo was more than just a pay driver. Continuing to extract performances out of the midfield car, Perez and the team were celebrated as underdogs for their achievements on a much smaller budget than many of their rivals. Sergio's funding helped keep the team alive and competitive, and when the team went into administration in 2018, Checo's decision to start legal action saved the company, allowing Lawrence Stroll to purchase it and turn it into the Aston Martin team we see on the grid now. Interestingly, despite Perez's move to Red Bull recently, his big sponsors are still there. You can catch the names Inter, Protection, Infinium, Claro, Telcel and Telmex dotted all over their livery. They may not have been a factor in Christian Horner's decision, but they always sweeten the deal. Rubens Barrichello Seen as the next hotshot Brazilian driver after Ayrton Senna, Rubens Barrichello gained support from food company Orisco during his junior days, which stayed with him throughout his early F1 career. Funnily enough though, his debut came courtesy of the same team that gave his future Ferrari teammate Michael Schumacher his first F1 start, Jordan. Eddie Jordan had already had the future seven-time champion slip through his fingers after his debut in 1991 and was looking to bring the next new talent up through the ranks. Impressed by his progression through the junior series, Jordan gave Rubens his own F1 debut in 1993, aged 20, thanks to the $2 million backing provided by Orisco. He eventually went on to race for Stewart, Ferrari, Honda, Braun and Williams across his 326 races, taking 11 wins and 68 podiums. He also held the record for the most race entries until Kimi Raikkonen overtook him at the 2020 Eiffel Grand Prix, something which shows he had the talent to deserve to stick around on the Formula 1 grid, not just the money. Mark Webber Fernando Alonso wasn't the only driver Flavio Briatore helped to get their start in Formula 1. At the time, the Benetton team owner gave Mark Webber his first shot as the team's test and reserve driver for the 2001 season. When the opportunity arose to race for Minardi in 2002, his manager Briatore once again assisted him, even if he did complain that the Aussies did nothing to support Webber. Though that wasn't actually true, his sponsors Ron Walker and telecoms company Telstra provided the backing to get Mark his breakthrough and brought his personal Aussie sponsors Fosters on board. Good call. His initial contract was just the first two races in 2002, but they managed to get him a full 17 Grand Prix deal that season. Weber later went on to take nine wins and 42 podiums, finishing third in the Drivers' Championship on three occasions in 2010, 2011 and 2013. Not bad for a number two driver. There you have it, a look into when F1 pay drivers were actually pretty damn good. Who starts in F1 most surprised you and does that change your view on pay drivers in Formula 1? Let us know in the comments section below.